So welcome to the first of a two-part virtual panel discussion based on a series of short videos for Mainers growing their first vegetable garden. The second part will be held Thursday, June 24th at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. The videos were cre created by the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, and hopefully you had a chance to view the first four videos in the series um, before tonight. Pamela Hargist, a home horticulture professional from the Cooperative Extension, will lead tonight's panel discussion, and she's joined by two Master Gardener volunteers, Tom Whitwicky and Tyra Mitchell. So I'm going to let um, Pamela take over here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, it's really great to have this session tonight with you all. Um, this is kind of a new format we're trying out because we created these video series um, last year. And so I'm excited to introduce um, our master gardeners who are joining tonight. Um, we have Tyra uh, Hatcher Mitchell, who grew up in Waterboro, harvesting tomatoes uh, with her mother and making pick a lily with her grandmother. A uh, lifelong gardener, she finished the Master Gardener course in 2018. Um, she has helped community and school gardens grow vegetables and donate them to local food pantries to help fight food insecurity in Maine. Uh, Tyra is currently growing vegetables and raising chickens in Freeport. And we also have Tom with Wiki, as um, mentioned. Um, so Tom and his wife, Nancy, have been serious gardeners since 1974. After moving, to, after moving the family to Maine from Vermont in 1990, uh, their interest expanded into small fruits, landscaping, annual and perennial flowers. Over the years, Tom's focus has been on expanding the outdoor gardening season earlier in the spring and later into the fall and winter. Uh, so Tom is kind of our expert into uh, in growing some unusual vegetable crops like sweet potatoes and artichokes. Um, and he also took the Master Gardener training with us here in Cumberland County in 2017. Uh, he's currently serving as um, the president of our Cumberland County Master Gardener Association. Um, and so, yes, I'm so excited you guys are joining us. And I think what we'll do is um, kind of kick off the conversation with some um, intro questions, things that we were thinking of in advance. Um, and again, feel free to put any questions in the chat. And at some point, we may just open it up um, for discussion. So, um, Tyra, I'm going to start with you because we were talking about um, just you know, helpful tips for beginner gardeners, maybe not getting too ahead of yourself um, when you're trying to start your own garden. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Oh, sure, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to talk to people who wanna talk about gardening as I've maxed out my family on that topic. So um, for me, one of the things that I feel like is really important when you're getting started gardening is to understand why you want to do it and what you want to grow. I think people sometimes go and buy tons of seeds and then they throw them on the ground and they have a mixed success and they sometimes feel like, oh, I'm just not good at gardening. When in truth, maybe you either didn't have the skill set or there were some things that you, missing information that could have been helpful to be more successful. So for me personally, I like to start with what does my family want to eat? Um, you can grow a ton of cucumbers, but if no one in your family is gonna eat them, what are you gonna do with them? So my why is really, I garden to feed my family. I garden to feed my soul. I, it is my happy place. It's a place that I can go and be creative and get my hands in the dirt. I have a, um, a very stressful job. And so when I come home at night and on the weekends, it's a place where I can lose myself and um, you know, really get involved in being creative with different varieties uh, and just doing experiments. Some things work really well. And then every year you build new skill sets. And also every year we understand that the environment we live in changes. So one year you might have a great uh, zucchini crop and the next year you might not have so many but maybe your potatoes did really well and so how can you build a skill set that you are excited about and you can expand on and um, for me it's it's a hobby certainly um, something I love to spend my free time doing and sharing with other people and so Tyra what do you do when you have a lot of extra produce 
um, that you grow? Is it, can your family handle it or do you try to preserve it? What do you do? Yeah, I think there's lots of different things. My, it's only my husband and I, so we share with um, our neighbors who don't have garden. At, we're the youngest sort of people in the neighborhood. So we have some older folks that live in, in, um, in and around where we are. So we'll drop things off at their house. I definitely do canning. I started dehydrating last year looking for recipes to try things that I hadn't tried before. There's uh, this year, I last year I had a lot of new squash varieties that I was trying. So I was looking for recipes again, like being creative, not only in the garden, but also in my kitchen. Um, and during the pandemic, it was certainly wonderful to be able to walk out into my garden and pick food that I could bring in the house and cook for my family. And then I always want to give a big shout out to the local pantries as a master gardener, um, we do community service hours and the last couple that I have done have been working in community and school gardens where we grew produce and donated it to the local food pantries so that in, beyond just getting, you know, what people needed for dry goods, they were able to get really high quality fresh vegetables that they were able to bring home to their family. Great, thank you. And Tom, I'm wondering what you are up to this time of the year um, in regards to your garden. Uh, are you doing any planning? Are you planting some seeds? What have you been up to? Yeah, so I've been I've been actually planting since February, <laughs> inside of course. Um, and uh, I know this is more geared to novice gardeners, but I built a uh, a small greenhouse last fall that I've been uh, getting a lot of use out of uh, right now. But what I'm planting right now in the garden is uh, peas. And um, uh, in fact, I've just got my early peas in. And uh, I've, I have a bed that's covered by a what's called a low tunnel. And in that bed, I have lettuce, uh, uh, um, chard, fennel, um, arugula, things like that. Things that are fairly hardy, you know, can take, can take uh, a little bit of freeze uh, without a problem. So. Uh, yeah, it's starting. It's starting. It's a, it's a, it's an exciting and stressful time of year <laughs> for me, anyways, because I have all these seedlings that uh, won't be happy until they're in the ground. But uh, right now, they're they're being babied. And Tom, I'm kind of put you on the spot here. I'm going to ask Tyra um, a little to talk a little bit more about this too. But um, one thing we also wanted to start with was to talk about the Master Gardener program. And oh. Tyra talked a little bit about that, but um, how, what was your experience becoming a master gardener? Um, what have you done since you have taken the training? You've obviously been pretty involved being on the board. Um, what was your experience overall? Yeah. So first of all, I, I have to say the, the training was just, uh, wonderful. I and mean, of course, it, at the time that I took the training in 2017, <laughs> it, it was, it was all live. It wasn't virtual. So I had the benefit of face-to-face uh, <clears throat> -face instructions from some of the horticulturalists from the uh, Cooperative Extension, which was, which was great. Um, <clears throat> but what, uh, what I uh, got involved in almost immediately was a, um, uh, one of our sponsored project gardens, which is a, actually a dialysis clinic out in, um, out in Westbrook. Um, and that was, a lot of, uh, that, all, that was a lot of fun helping, helping, the, helping get that garden going working with some of the patients um, uh, in terms of educating them in terms of, you know, good, good food and eating well and things like that. And, and uh, some of them really had an interest in gardening, which I was you know, happy to be able to, to share with them. Um, and I, then I became involved with the board itself. Uh, so I've been on the board now for three years uh, and that's been a great experience. Uh, you can think of the board sort of like as a uh, booster uh, uh, association for the uh, for the overall master gardener program you know we we have a main fundraiser every year which is the plant sale which is coming up in, in uh, the latter part of may so uh if you're interested in some great you know seedlings and and uh, um, and perennial flowers there'll be there'll be plenty there and we're doing it online this year for the first time so that's going to be that's a challenge obviously but uh i think we're we've made a great start towards it so um I'm going to go to the first question that came in and um, we will come back around to Tyra 
um, you can talk about your experience as a master gardener, but um, Scott and Meredith say that um, they are planning to make some cold frames using old windows. Any tips or things to keep in mind when hardening off plants in general and with making these cold frames? Tom, I'm going to go to you first. Yeah, I can, uh, I, I can help with that. Uh, be before I had my greenhouse, I started with a cold frame. Um, I, I will say that the critical part of a cold frame, uh, I'll get to making it in a minute, is, is uh, being on top of the ventilation. Uh, be because the cold frame space is small, it can open quickly. Um, now the plants can take it if they're well watered, but if you, if you forget to water and forget to open it, you're done for. <laughs> and I've, I've, I've had uh, some, uh, some bad experiences with it. So you need to be on top of it. But having said that, it's a, it's a, great, um, it's a great way to uh, start your seedlings and harden them off as, as, the, as the question was, uh, was, was, uh, was, was talked about. Um, in terms of making it, uh, you know, you wanna be able to have a decent size. I just, in fact, I just made uh, another one because uh, I needed to actually have a space during the summer because I raised seedlings, mainly brassica seedlings during the summer for fall production and needed a place to put those where I didn't have to bring them in, put them inside and outside the greenhouse all the time. So I made a cold frame for that. So, uh, you know, fit, fit the cold frame to your, to your covering is what uh, is, is the suggestion that I would, that I would make. Mine, mine is four by eight approximately <clears throat> um, with a slope to, you know, towards the south if you can manage it. Great, thank you, Tom. And Lucy is asking, how do I buy plants online as you were mentioning? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can uh, give that answer. You probably have better information than me. Yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> so um, I have to give it to the Master Gardeners working on our online plant sale this year. So um, we will have more information on our website um, probably by the weekend in terms of, you know, kind of expectations for what, um, how the online ordering system will work, but it will um, be launched on Mother's Day. Um, and there'll be a two week window where you can place an order. And then over the long Memorial Day weekend, um, in, in your ordering, you'll be able to select the time to pick up. So it's, it's basically ordering online in advance. And then over the Memorial Day weekend, you can pick up at the time you selected. Um, so there'll be a really nice um, image catalog to look through of, you know, as Tom mentioned, it's going to be herbaceous, perennials, woody perennials, uh, vegetable seedlings, herbs, and, and flower seedlings. So it's going to be a lot of things to choose from, all of which have been grown locally. Some might be grown by Master Gardener volunteers, um, but it'll be a pretty extensive catalog. So um, definitely be on the lookout for that. And I'd be happy to share the link with you guys when we do go live so you can easily find it. <laughs> And if I could add, the, uh, the, the pickup actually is going to be in Falmouth at the Falmouth Village Park, it's called, which is behind Walmart. So that's where you go to, uh, to pick up the, uh, the plants after you've ordered them. And, and the pickups will be scheduled as well in order to, to promote social distancing. Thank you, Tom. Very important thing to mention. Where the heck are you picking up plants? <laughs> um, Great. Well, um, I want to just pause for a second and give people the opportunity if there's if there are any questions um, you guys have. Since we have a small enough group, I think we can, if you want to unmute yourself, you're welcome to. So Pam, it's Pamela, it's Catherine. Is, so is Memorial Day traditionally the safe time in Maine to plant things outside or? Yeah, Memorial Day is um, around that time is typically good. I would say just keep an eye on the weather because la as a lot of you guys may remember last year, we got a uh, freezing temperatures very close to Memorial Day, maybe even after, I don't quite remember. It was the end of May. What was that Tyra? It was May 19th. 
<laughs> ingrained in your head, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, so I think Memorial Day generally is good, but what you want to be looking for is um, the night temperatures to be um, right around or above um, 50 degrees. So that's especially important for those warm weather uh, vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant. Um, but, you know, as Tom mentioned, cooler crops can be planted sooner than that. Um, but that's kind of a good rule of thumb. But uh, I think it doesn't hurt to wait until the first week of June just to be safe. I would I feel like sometimes people have all these plants and they're just so excited to get them in the garden. And I will often plant maybe a half or a third to get started. And then the next week, just in case there is some kind of odd weather, the, the plants that I care, for me personally, I care the most about my tomatoes. I do a lot of canning. I make a lot of um, salsa and spaghetti sauce. And so those plants in particular, I always wait until I'm very certain that I'm not going to have a frost, they're tender. So I tend to plant my tomatoes in um, the first week of June. Um, and if I am going to test a few just to, you know, push the, the time, I might do a few of them, but I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't do all of my tender um, plants Memorial Day weekend, but everything else is usually okay. Did you, what do you think, Tom? Yeah, as you were talking, I was I was thinking about um, what I do, and I I basically have continual planting all all spring through the summer um, because I I uh, I plant some of the some of the vegetables that really do mature well for the fall, such as brassicas. Mm -hmm. I only plant those for fall harvest, you know, fall into early winter, versus trying to grow them in the summer. And some some plants just don't do well in summer heat. Mm -hmm. uh, such as the brassicas. Um, so, uh, you know, my advice is to try to try to organize your 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 uh, planting so that uh, it maximizes the, you know, when the when the plants do best. You know, there are plants for early spring, such as arugula. You try planting arugula in the summer, it gets bitter, so that doesn't work. Uh, spinach is an, another early spring crop. You can also try for a fall crop. So um, it it takes a little bit of you know learning to understand what's what you know what is uh, planted best when but uh, it's a, it's a good way to think about it rather than trying to get your garden in as they say uh, think about planting all you know all season so going along with that um, I'm hoping Tyra or Tom I'll let you guys um, both address this um, what about hardening off seedlings is that an important thing to do um, and if so, how do you harden off your own seedlings? And what does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to throw a monkey wrench into it, but I actually winter sow, so I don't go through the hardening off process except for with my tomatoes. So um, I actually start planting things in January in milk containers that are sitting outside waiting for the spring season. And by the time it's time for me to transplant, they're already grown. Um, with my tomatoes that I do grow inside and I do need to harden off. I, I really baby my tomatoes because I really care the most about them. And I take them in and out for a very long time, much longer than most people would be willing to. You know, I'll just, just add to that. So the, the reason why you need to do a you know, hardening off is that if you try moving a plant that's been in a very sheltered, uh, you know, constant temperature light environment outside, uh, they're not going to like it. They, they get shocked and uh, they, they will even, you know, they will even die. So you need to gradually acclimate them to the outside uh, climate and light. Um, <clears throat> one way of doing that is to kind of just move them in and out for a brief period of time every day. Uh, another way of doing it is putting in the garden, but covering them with a row cover, a floating row cover, which is what I primarily do. Uh, and that works really well too, because the, the row cover provides its own little microclimate uh, and uh, kind of sh shelters them from, from the extremes until they're ready for it. Um, and while I'm on the subject, I mean, the floating row cover is also great for keeping insects off uh, plants in the, uh, in the spring. Uh, I do that with all my squashes, for instance, to uh, to prevent the squash bugs from from getting at them until they're till they're more mature and hardened off, and that's that works pretty well. 
it looks like we have another question in the chat. Um, do you fence your garden or plant enough for the animals? <laughs> <clears throat> I definitely have a fenced garden. We live across from an old apple orchard and we have deer, it's like a deer super highway. So we knew immediately we were going to have to fence our garden if we wanted to keep it. So I have, um, I have a 32 by 40 fenced in area that are things that the deer would mostly like to eat. And if anything sticks out from that fence, they definitely nibble it. So I know that they are there. Um, and it's about seven feet tall. My neighbor ne next door to me gardens very close to where I have my garden and she doesn't fence, but she wraps it in, um, she has stakes in all four corners and she wraps it with rope and she has little tin pie things and it mostly works, but the deer will occasionally get into her garden. Yeah, the, uh, it's, I think it's essential to, to fence your garden uh, in this area. I mean, we do have occasional deer. That's not our main problem. Uh, our main problem is, is uh, woodchucks, which can devastate. Um, so we, when you build a fence, uh, have some, uh, wire, wire mesh that extends below ground about six inches to keep the woodchucks out. There's, there's nothing worse than coming out in the morning and seeing, seeing a row of, of beans or whatever devastated by woodchuck. They come out the day before you're going to harvest. Yeah, you know, actually, the, 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 the more, uh, one of the peskiest uh, uh, animals for us has been squirrels. Uh, they, we have to basically create a a bunker around our strawberries or else they'll, uh, they'll yeah. eat all the strawberries. It's, it's awful. <laughs> yeah. And one thing um, I'll speak to what we do, we have a demonstration garden um, called Tidewater Farm in Falmouth. If you ever get the chance, you should definitely check it out. It's um, kind of behind um, the Walmart, um, just off of Route 1, pretty well, not super easy to find right now because we're working on getting a sign, but uh, we do have a website that can direct you to the right location. Um, but we um, use one of those movable fences. So it's actually the kind of white electrical fence, but we don't use, you know, use the electric um, component of it. It works pretty well, although um, we have had deer that can hop over later, usually later in the season when they're really looking, they've been looking at the garden for a while. <laughs> I'm just making up the story in my head. Um, <laughs> they jump over and the, the first thing they go for are the sweet potatoes uh, leaves in our garden. But um, that has worked pretty well for us. And it's nice too for if you're in an area where maybe you don't want to, it might be an upfront cost, but um, if you, it gives you a little bit of flexibility. If you ever move the garden, you can always, you know, move your fence with it. Um, so just a thought there. You know, speaking of deer, uh, one of the things that um, I've heard works pretty well, I haven't tried it myself, but other people swear by it, is to lay fencing flat on the ground uh, or suspend it a little bit because deer don't like their hooves being messed with with anything. And that'll keep them from getting near the fence and being able to jump over it. So if you don't, if you don't want to put an eight foot high deer fence up, then uh, that's that's an uh, an alternative. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. And sometimes people will do two rows of fencing, so they'll do like you know kind of a low fence, and then a few feet in, they'll do a little bit of a higher fence because they tend to not also want. They they need to see where they're going to jump into, and if it's too close together, that will discourage them too. Right. So another question in the chat, is it too late to start seeds inside or should I just stick with seedlings? Tyra, I, I would say it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely not too late for something. For instance, uh, cucurbits, you know, uh, cucumbers, uh, squash, both winter and summer squash, melons. Uh, actually, it's, it's a little bit early to start those. You wanna probably wait until May 1st uh, to start those because it takes about a month from germination to, to when they're ready to go in the garden. So th that's a perfect timing for that. Um, it's probably not too late to start uh, tomatoes as long as you, you know, want, are patient and, and uh, you know, don't want to have really early tomatoes. It's probably too late for some of the other things like uh, peppers and eggplants 
uh, things like that. Tara, do you have a thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything you said. I think oh, that's like probably the most asked question on any garden forum is, can I start, can I start? And to me, the best advice is to know your sort of anticipated last frost mm -hmm. date and like circle it, circle it, circle it on your calendar. So for me in Freeport, my anticipated last frost date is May 16th. And so when you look on the back of your seeds and it says start four to six weeks before your last frost date, you can sort of count back from that and then you kind of get an idea. It also comes into play with your common sense. I know for me, I'm not going to plant tomatoes until the first week of June and I don't want a hundred of them in my house. So I'm gonna count back from the first week in June and that's how I decide when I'm going to start my plants. People can give you a lot of advice and as you, um, start gardening in your own area and in your own home, you're gonna develop like what works for you. I personally don't like a lot of seedlings in my house and I don't have grow lights and I live in a small space. So that's why I started doing winter sowing. And that's why for some things I do actually buy seedlings because I just can't, I don't have the space um, to have all of the seedlings, but it's not too late. And even just experiment, if you try like, you know, start a couple, of things you want this week and a couple next week and a couple of the week after. And then you can start to see like, oh, wow, this is how fast these are growing. And then you can, you know, take them out in the way that's meaningful to you. But write, but keep track of it all, write it all down. I have a calendar on my wall that I write everything I'm doing on. And then I actually keep it from year to year. So I can kind of look back and go, oh yeah, I remember in 2020, May 19th, we had that weird hailstorm that took out all my peas. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. In fact, uh, I use a spreadsheet to keep track of the, my planting dates as well. Even better. And, and we find that, uh, you know, over the years so that I, I know when things need to be planted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love um, what you said, Tyra, about uh, just the practicality of it. I think that um, you're absolutely right. I mean, having, if you're in a position as a beginner gardener, you don't have grow lights, you might not want to grow tomatoes um, and, or peppers or eggplant because they do need more time and you really do need that supplemental light for them. Um, you might want to look to buy seedlings for those and instead maybe start cucumbers inside, but those can also be direct seeded as well um, when the soil's warm enough. Um, and there's a lot of things that you could direct seed, especially in the summer, like beans are super easy to grow. Um, so kind of direct your energy on the things like Tyra was saying in the beginning, the, the foolproof things that you're going to feel really good about because you grew them for the first time this year, instead of trying, you know, the more difficult um, vegetables. And there's also a lot of really fun herbs to grow too, and flowers. I love kind of incorporating that in the garden, um, you know, dill, cilantro are very easy to grow. The, they can be direct seeded. Um, basil, you could start inside um, as well, but um, little things like that can kind of brighten up your garden and, and add that nice fragrance as well. Definitely. So I see another question here. Um, Scott and Meredith, we have two medium raised beds. How would you recommend including flowers inside or nearby to encourage pollinators? We don't want to lose too much of the bed space for these. I love planting flowers that are edible. So I, um, bee balm, I have planted and used on cheese plates before. You know, you don't want to eat a lot of that, but a little bit. Uh, calendula is a flower that grows really easily and, you, and is edible. Um, I always plant marigolds. Marigolds are one of those companion plants that most other plants really like, and they are beautiful and they're easy to grow. Um, so I would, you know, stick them in the corners. You could plant them just outside if you wanted to. Marigolds too are nice for uh, confusing insects. So that's a, a great way to have some flowers in your raised beds to attract pollinators. And then some of the herbs, dill attracts pollinators and it's beautiful. And then you're able to use it if you, especially if you're a canner and you make pickles, it's a great herb to have in your garden. 
an idea you might want to think about is to uh, is to use movable pots for some of the flowers uh, as well. You know, you can position them where the light is optimal, um, and that way it won't take space, you know, valuable space from your from your vegetable beds as well. I've been I've been doing more and more uh, flowers in pots uh, as as the years go by. Actually, it's it's nice to be able to put them where they uh, where they're to the best advantage for viewing. And what are some of your favorite flowers to grow in pots, Tom? Well, uh, I do a lot of uh, tender things. Uh, let's see, uh, a lot of uh, pelargonia uh, geraniums uh, in the vernacular. <laughs> so I, I, I take cuttings of those uh, in the fall. So I have many of those to plant out. So I put those in pots. Um, some, um, I have some um, clivia as well that uh, that's, you know, it's a house plant in the winter. So it, it goes outside for the summer. So that's nice. Um, I grow pansies, they're blooming now, they're outside in pots on my patio, so that's nice. Uh, let's see, what are some of the other things that I have tried, tried in pots? Um, and you know, anything low growing will do fine in pots like marigolds or um, uh, petunias, something like that. Um, just some other ideas. Great. Yeah, and there's two things I wanted to mention um, hearing Tyra and Tom talk. Um, so dill and cilantro and another herb, lovage, which is less commonly known, but it's a perennial herb, um, actually attract uh, parasitic wasps. So um, that's a beneficial insect. Um, so if you want to, and they're also pollinators. So if you want to attract, you know, Planting a diversity of flowers and vegetables will often support um, more pollinators and insects. So um, those I definitely recommend. And you know, cilantro and dill are super easy to grow. And like Tyra said, beautiful flowers. Um, another one that um, I was surprised you guys didn't mention mention it, but I'm very excited to to share it. Um, <laughs> is uh, nasturtium. Nasturtium super course. easy to grow. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Right? I I, I could have sworn you guys are going to say it, um, but nasturtium, you can direct seed it right in the ground. Um, really beautiful flower, edible, kind of spicy. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have trailing nasturtium too. So if you wanted to um, grow, you know, kind of trellis it, if you're looking to gain space vertically, that would be another really good option. Um, so those two things I was thinking of there. And um, let's see, Joy's asking, what are some edible flowers that are easy to grow? Well, nasturtium is definitely one of them. And I think Tyra listed off quite a few, um, the calendula and any of the herb flowers too, like cilantro, dill, um, um, violas, which, you know, a lot of them are growing naturally. What am I missing here? Uh, Tyra and Tom, I know you mentioned a few of them. Um, I like bee balm. I think that looks really pretty. It, you don't want to eat a lot of it. It's very strong, but it's one of my favorites actually. And yeah, the nasturtium. Um, I mean, I, I'll grow poppies in my garden, marigolds, sunflowers. Sunflowers obviously take, you know, longer to get going, but um, I find that they they're the ones that keep the bees the happiest, the longest. So in the fall, what I love about sunflowers in the fall, they're the last ones there. And you'll see the bees kind of, you know, sleeping behind the petals. And that just makes me feel like we're able to extend summer a little bit longer. Yeah, I don't know about edible, but if you have a fence or want to go vertical, you know, some of the annual ornamental vines are really can be very attractive. Uh, we do morning glories. Uh, now every year and they're they're just spectacular on a fence they they grow you know 15 feet 15 foot vines uh just from you know right. from the, and uh sweet peas is another thing you can do on a fence oh sure and even some of the vegetables so when your flowers start coming out for your squash plants mm -hmm. if you're finding that you have a lot of the male flowers and the females haven't started yet you could a lot of people will um, pick those and eat them. And the one thing I wanted to mention since Tyra um, brought up bee balm. So, so some of these plants 
um, they can be started outside. So some of these perennial herbs, um, you could direct sow them. But one thing I really like to do is start them um, in a pot outside um, and just sprinkle the seeds. For instance, bee balm, um, you can sprinkle the seeds right on the soil, press it in, um, maybe just barely cover it because it often needs light to germinate. Um, seeds that are super small um, are, tend to be the ones that need light for germination. And just keep a close eye on it. Don't let any critters go in, maybe protect it, and um, it'll start sprouting in a few weeks. Um, it actually grows very prolifically. I ended up having way too much last year <laughs> thinking, oh, you know, I'm just going to start some pods. And now I have like hun hundreds of bee balm plants that I don't know what to do with. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of thinking creatively about the space you have, not everything needs to be started indoors under grow lights. A lot of things can also be started outside. And some things actually do well, they do so well direct sowing that to me, it's just not worth the indoor real estate. So my cucumbers usually take off really well. So I direct sow those right into the ground and beans and peas. Those aren't things that I would, I personally would spend the time inside doing because they just take off. And even like zucchini, I mean, you can plant a couple of zucchini plants and have probably all you're going to want for the summer without and doing that just from direct sowing. You can also use a succession planting uh, yes. a regimen with things like cucumbers and zucchini, which we started doing actually just last year. And it's worked out really well because cucumbers, for instance, kind of peter out, you know, after a little while. So having, you know, fresh plants coming uh, really keeps the, keeps the harvest coming. Definitely. And same so thing, and also succession planting while you're direct sowing. So if you're putting in like zucchini and surrounding it with radishes, you know, by the time the radishes start to get big, you're going to be able to take those out and then the zucchini is coming up. And so you always have something going in your garden. I, I think for me personally, that's the, that is my um, ultimate goal is to, to not have bare soil, is to always have something happening. Always have something going in as something's coming out. Um, so that I can, especially in Maine, where we have a shorter season, I really want to try to maximize the space I have. Oh, and that's the, that's the vegetable I forgot that's in the ground right now, radishes. Um, yeah. There's nothing like a spring radish. They get, get kind of bitter uh, towards the summer, but in the spring, they're just wonderful. Yeah, and maybe we should uh, spend a moment talking about some of those things that are pretty easy to grow and um, also have a quick turnaround. Radishes, I feel like, are a perfect example of something that typically takes about three weeks, maybe four weeks, um, from the time in which you plant it um, to the time it's ready to harvest. Of course, this kind of depends on the weather, temperature, and those elements. Um, but what else could be planted in kind of the earlier spring um, that might be relatively quick or, or worth growing. What do you guys think? What are you doing, Tom? Well, spinach is certainly one that comes to mind. Um, you know, it's probably maybe a six week uh, window from, from start to finish for spinach, um, but it's definitely, it's definitely great. And you can also get that in very early. It's one of the things that, uh, you know, will tolerate, tolerate cold. And in fact, you can overwinter spinach uh, as well as a way of getting an extra early crop. Uh, you know, certainly lettuce, arugula, those things are about you know, six weeks start to finish as well. So those are definitely worth getting in early. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, uh, cor uh, uh, coriander is, is another one, another early spring thing that we plant. But that's <clears throat> we do succession plantings all summer for that as well. Yeah, I'd say my number one is kale. I just keep planting kale. There's so many things you can do with it. And again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. You really challenge yourself. I think there are a lot of people who say, I don't like radishes, why would I plant them? But when you start realizing you can roast radishes and it totally changes the flavor. Or for me, one of my favorite things to do with radishes, I um, on a mandolin slice it super, super thin and then put it on like a crostini with a, like a tarragon butter and it sort of melts and you don't have that like bitter taste that some people don't like. So there are lots of foods that if you kind of look at different ways, instead of just putting it in your salad or eating it raw, that you might actually really like. 
or, you know, like carrots, some people don't realize that you can take the greens and make a pesto. So if you don't want to grow a lot of basil or you don't like basil pesto, maybe you could try it with the um, carrot greens instead. That's a new one on me. <laughs> <laughs> I like yeah. Yeah, carrot greens are an awesome substitute, especially for parsley. Definitely don't toss toss those greens out. Um, they're really good um, with seafood, you know, kind of all the traditional ways you might use. I always think of parsley, but um, yeah, that's an excellent example. Um, there's something you said, Tyra, that I wanted to like hit on and now I'm forgetting. Oh, I was going to say I'm getting very hungry because I haven't <laughs> had dinner yet. <laughs> And listening to the description of food is just, you know, making my mouth water. <laughs> um, I, I did want to follow up on what you said about kale. For us, we grow we grow kale as a fall crop, and you know, not during the summer, because we think the the flavor is far superior in the fall. It actually mm -hmm. does better in the fall. I mean, there's nothing like kale that's been frosted to. Uh, to oh do yeah. Too um, in fact, all of our brassicas we grow as fall crops rather than summer crops because they just do so well in the fall. Yeah. Broccoli, cauliflower, things like that. Uh, it's pretty hard to actually mature uh, cauliflower in the summer <laughs> if you tried, but it's very easy if you, uh, if you plant it for the fall. I think that's the other thing that's really important to keep in mind in your area. And so people can give you advice, but keeping notes also helps you um, do better year after year. So what is the pest pressure in your area? So in my area, the um, squash vine borer is horrible. Mm -hmm. So I know like as much as I would like to get my squash plants in early, I either need to kind of hold off a little bit or I need to use row covers um, if I want to do that. And just like um, Tom was saying, like cauliflower and broccoli, you you can keep it in your garden all summer. It's not really going to do very well. It doesn't like the heat. So what what could you put in instead that would give you um, more success and happiness than tr you know trying to force a cauliflower to grow in the heat where it's just not going to do well? Yeah, we we uh, have actually very good success uh, following peas with all the brassicas. Mm -hmm. uh, the timing is just about right for when the peas are done. The, uh, the brassica seedlings, which I started early, go in and then they mature in time for the fall. So that's a it's a great succession planning or planting if you if you can uh, if you can manage it. So I have to say I know this is covered in the next series of videos, but because we keep talking about it, um, Tyra or Tom or both of you guys, um, what are what do you mean when you talk about succession planting? I feel like we kind of touched on it, but maybe we haven't laid it out fully and it could be helpful to kind of define it and maybe give an example. Well, there's, there's, there's a couple of ways of thinking about it. You can think of succession planting as planting of the same variety in succession, like lettuce, for instance. We have, we probably plant six or seven different lettuce, lettuce plantings during the season because lettuce only lasts a, a short time and then it's done. So that's one way of thinking about succession. The other way is, is, is the peas to brassicas example. You replace one vegetable with another vegetable. And as Tyra said, the, the goal is to have your, have your garden always in production of some sort, never have bare ground. So uh, uh, that's, one, that's another way of thinking about succession planting. Great, thank you. So um, Scott and, oh, well, a few comments about um, kind of troubleshooting issues. I, I know this was put in the chat a while ago, but I um, was talking about how there were black bugs on towards the end of the season on nasturtium. I just wanted to mention that uh, we, Humane Extension can help troubleshoot any issues you might have in your garden, including pests. So we for good or bad, I don't know, we get a lot of pests in our office and as well as photos. So people will take photos, email it to us and we can help you identify it if you think it's affecting uh, the growth of your plants. <laughs> and uh, I love your comment about young gardeners. Yay, <laughs> how sweet. <laughs> um, 
And so if you if you ever come across what you think might be a pest or you're having an issue with your plant and it looks kind of weird, um, feel free to email us any photos you might have um, and we can help troubleshoot the issue with you. Um, and I'm just going to put a plug out. I don't know if this is true for Scott and Meredith, but um, definitely, as you've learned in the videos, getting your soil tested is the way to go. And if you're able to do that around this time of the year, it still gives you plenty of time to kind of amend your soil and set yourself up for success. Um, generally, I think the fall is kind of a good time to test your soil because if you need to adjust the pH at all, um, it'll take some time for either sulfur or lime to kind of um, come into play with your soil. So um, just putting it out there. I don't know if that was the case for Scott and Meredith with the difficulty you guys had, um, but feel free to uh, reach out if, if there's any specific problems that you're experiencing. I also want to say last year was a very difficult year for lots of reasons. It was quite dry in June and then it got really wet in July. So I've been gardening my whole life and I had things that I've never dealt with before that I really felt like were uh, challenging for me last year. So, you know, sometimes there are environmental factors that play a role in how our gardens do during a particular year. And so again, like kind of keeping an eye and journaling things, you know, especially as climates change and we have like in my area, for example, this year has been so incredibly windy and that's not something I've really had to deal with before. So, you know, things change from year to year. Um, maybe this year you'll have better luck. I would say carrot. I think a lot of people have problems with carrots and there's some really interesting videos online about um, different ways you can plant carrots. There's a board method that you, you can use where you, um, you know, plant your seeds and, and, and wet the ground and plant your seeds and then cover it with a board so that it gets its germination going without wind or animals picking away at them. That might be something that helps you get them started so they're stronger. Um, what were the other ones? She was saying pumpkins. Again, you, um, you know, without knowing exactly what the problem was with pumpkins, but if they got if they were too dry in the beginning and they never really got going. Sometimes when plants struggle in the beginning, it gets tough to help them get past that. So it's really being aware of the water, the air, the temperature, if there are pests that are coming into play. Yeah, I could add, I can add some, some things about carrots. Um, carrots are notoriously difficult to germinate because they need to be kept moist for a period mm -hmm. of two weeks that's what it takes before the carrots germinate. So if you let those dry out even for a day, uh, you, you, you're gonna basically have a crop failure. Right. So um, I've experimented over the years with, a, with the best way of doing that. And what I do is plant a small furrow, put the carrot seeds in and put vermiculite in the, mm -hmm. the, uh, in the path. The vermiculite tends to keep it moist. And then I cover the whole bed with a, with a row cover flat on the ground. Uh, now, generally speaking, that's that's worked. But last year, <laughs> last year it didn't work. And I, th I think the la what happened last year is that there was a deluge just when the carrots were germinating and it drowned them. So mm -hmm. it, there's you know there's no predicting what the weather's going to do. It, uh, but I will say that uh, gardening is nothing but a humbling experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. And I'll just add that the what we've used before with carrots is um, burlap. We've covered it. And actually, we've done this with other things, too. Uh, we found that we have a lot of um, birds that love to come and eat our, our pea seeds, for an example, or like when we do a, a small cover crop. And this is on a very small scale. Um, so we'll, we'll do just what you know, Tyra described, um, you know, wet the soil, cover it with burlap. But the reason why I like the burlap, and I, I think this goes the same with the row cover, is that you can just water straight through it. Mm -hmm. um, but it does help keep, uh, you know, the soil a little bit more moist. Um, but Tom and Tyra, you're totally right. It's all about the environment too. And it changes from year to year, which is why, you know, keeping a journal can be so important. And um, one thing I wanted to say about that was 
uh, one journal that I love to have is just buying one of those weekly planners because it's already all set up for me. I can just, you know, look at the month, I can look by the day. And then for me, I'm gardening with other people um, at our demonstrations garden. So I can easily leave notes for them. So having that common space where we can kind of communicate together and both write notes is really helpful. So there's a few questions here I just want to get to. Um, I know we're running out of time. Um, now, this one, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to help very much with. I'm not sure if Tyra and Tom have some thoughts, but Joy is asking about what herbs or plants repel bugs and mosquitoes. I don't have any recommendations for myself. Or, I, you know, I, from I, we have lemongrass planted I, near where we eat dinner. That's my sort of favorite for mosquitoes. Anything that's worked for you, Tom? No, I, it's, it's not something that I've, that I've experimented with, so I, I, I can't say. I know I've become very comfortable with wearing um, insect netting, at least on my home property, because we have a lot of mosquitoes here being so close to a vernal pool. Um, so I'm sorry, Joy, I wish we had more recommendations for you. Um, and then uh, Nancy is asking about whether cooperative extension can come to out to someone's home to help with a problem. You gave the example of high bush blueberries. So, um, so because the demand is so large for gardening, we can not, we're not able to come out to private um, people's prop people's private property to troubleshoot things. Um, instead, we'll work with you to get to get either photos or anything that you can send us to help troubleshoot any problems. However, if you were a commercial grower, we do have that capacity and support. Um, but I will put a quick plug out there for, we have a um, virtual garden mentorship program where we match um, main residents with master gardeners who will provide support um, either over the phone, email, text, whatever you and um, your garden mentor would decide. Um, so that's another alternative. If you feel like you need a little bit of a coach um, for this season, we do have that program online and maybe I can follow up with Lucy with the link for that. Also, the, if you go um, to the Cooperative Extension website too, there are bulletins. And I know that there are many, or a couple anyway, on blueberry bushes. And I think that there are some YouTube videos from um, that have been done about blueberries also. We're gonna end with this question. We've just got a few minutes left. Um, so Catherine's asking about favorite gardening books that you recommend. Tyra, Tom, do you have any favorites? I do. Uh, I like uh, anything by Elliot Coleman. Uh, he's written a number of number of books, um, and, and his wife uh, Barbara Damrush, uh, I believe, has also put out some put out some nice uh, nice books that I've enjoyed reading. And some. Um, oh, go ahead, Tyra. Garden book that I didn't like. There are just. I mean, there's always a nugget in every one that you read. There's one. Um, I believe it's called. Carrots Love Tomatoes, and it's about companion planting. That's really nice. Um, for people who follow, there are a lot of YouTube gardeners. Um, Jessica <laughs> Sowards, who has a, a Roots and Refuge farm, and she has a Facebook following. She just put out a book for beginner gardeners that's very basic, but very um, encouraging. And my favorite all-time favorite gardener is Monty Don. So if you um, get on YouTube and Google Monty Don, he is part of, um, I believe it's called Gardener's World. He's a British gardener and so much information, more information than you ever thought you'd want to know about gardening. You could watch it for the rest of your life and learn something. I love that show. <laughs> yeah. And he's great. And he, he's very passionate about what he does and he takes it so seriously, but he's also really just, um, it's just a lot of fun to watch, to see what they can do um, with gardening. And most of it is gardening that he does around his house. So it really, he really is a backyard gardener. Yeah, he has a wonderful personality. Although you do have to realize that the UK is mostly uh, zone eight. So yes. you have to take sure. it with a grain of salt, but. Uh, other than that, it's a wonderful show. Mm -hmm. 
Actually, one of our uh, master gardeners here in Cumberland County was featured in one of the most recent episodes. Um, Okay. Yeah, she submitted a, uh, you guys, I don't know if you guys saw this, but a short video about starting seeds inside. Yeah, Kendra, she, yeah, I was like so surprised she shared it with me. So that was pretty cool. That's cool. (laughs) So I think with that, we're pretty much out of time. And um, that, is so, that hour flew by. It's so fun to just talk about gardening for an hour. Um, and, and I encourage you guys, I, if you have any questions as you get going, um, I will make sure um, I get the right email address for, for Lucy to send out or whoever um, as a follow-up. And you feel free to reach out to the Cooperative Extension Office if anything comes up. Any last words, Tyra, Tom? Any uh, inspiration you want to share with others? <laughs> I would say there's no unsuccessful gardening. If you give it a try, you will have success. And even if you have a failure, the success is that you'll learn how to do it better next time. So I encourage you to use your garden as an, uh, a place to be your experimental classroom and just try it because you never know. You might find a new method. There are still people finding new methods to gardening even today. Gardening is good for the soul. That's how I'll end it. <laughs> Definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining us. I don't know if, um, you know, Catherine or Lucy, yeah. if there's any last words you need to share or reminders. So thank you so much, Pamela, Tom, and Tyra, um, for all of that helpful information. And we hope um, that everyone comes back for our second segment. So that's going to be Thursday, June 24th at 6.30. And um, we're asking you if you can go back to the videos and watch videos five through eight um, before that program and come with your questions. So thank you so much. And we'll see everyone next time in June. It'll be a warm, beautiful summer by then. <laughs>